Psychological horror is a subgenre of horror and psychological fiction with a particular focus on mental, emotional, and psychological states to frighten, disturb, or unsettle its audience. The subgenre frequently overlaps with the related subgenre of psychological thriller and often uses mystery elements and characters with unstable, unreliable, or disturbed psychological states to enhance the suspense, drama, action, and paranoia of the setting and plot, and to provide an overall unpleasant, unsettling, or disturbing atmosphere. Generally, horror media isn't my gig. I'm very easily scared, so I usually try to stay away from jump scare horror because even the dumbest spooks can keep me awake for the next week. But the subgenre that I respect and am fascinated with the most is psychological horror. Honestly, it's just interesting to see how instead of throwing something scary in the audience's face, a movie or game can just make them uncomfortable, anxious, on the edge of their seat. But you read the title, and you know what game I'm talking about, so let's get right into it. Obvious spoiler warnings for Amori but also Yume Niki, which I have to talk about in order to properly analyze Amori's psychological horror. There's also some brief mentions of certain twists from Doki Doki Literature Club, Spec Ops The Line, and Silent Hill 2. Amori is a game about a normal teenage boy dreaming about going on fun and fantastical adventures with his three best friends through forests, space colonies, pink castles, underwater hotels, desert oasis, and the bowels of a primordial sea mammal. Oh right, it's also a game about the mental health of said normal teenage boy as he spirals into depression, anxiety, and dissociative amnesia due to repressed trauma from killing his much-loved older sister and destroying his entire friend group, as well as the well-being of his best best friend, Basil. Hooray. There are very few jump scares in this game, because most of the scares are derived from creepy music, atmosphere, and character designs. In this video, I will be going through a number of psychological horror elements in Amori, and explaining why they are successful at scaring the player. So let's keep this intro short, and get going. Foreshadowing is a literary device in which a writer gives an advance hint of what is to come later in the story. Foreshadowing is a very good element of psychological horror games, because on replays, the player will be able to spot the hints and realise that twists and turns in the story have been staring them in the face the whole time, which can make even a replay just a little bit more unsettling. Foreshadowing is used a lot in Amori, as there are a lot of things that refer to the main twist of the game in very subtle ways. Here are a few. The tutorial emotion chart shows Amori as neutral, Aubrey as angry, Kel as happy, and Hiro as sad. The only person omitted is Basil, who represents the hidden emotion of afraid. This also hints at how their real-life counterparts coped with Mari's death. Sunny dissociated and forgot all about his trauma, Aubrey became more aggressive and joined a gang of outcasts, Kel tried to make new friends to cope with the collapse of his previous friend group, Hiro became a shut-in due to grief of the loss of his lover, and Basil became much more anxious as he hid his responsibility in framing Mari's death. Three of the bosses in Headspace, Space Ex-Boyfriend, Sweetheart, and the Unbred Twins, can have three levels of emotion. All party members can only have two levels of emotions, except Amori, who can have three. This hints at Amori being a boss the player will eventually have to fight. During the first Headspace chapter, Kel and Aubrey get in an argument and accidentally push Basil over. They apologise, but he casually says accidents happen. Mari's death was certainly an accident, and was indeed the result of an argument between two characters. The acrophobia something shoves you as its main damaging move. This is made even scarier in that the something manifests as the flight of stairs itself. The end of the arrow maze in Orange Oasis has a room with a smiley poster saying, you did it, with a jump rope on the floor. It references the fact that Sunny and Basil hanged Mari using a rope, and personally, I find this to be the creepiest bit of foreshadowing in the game. In these ways, Amori uses foreshadowing to confuse the player on a first playthrough, but can deliver a bigger shock to someone on their second playthrough who is able to pick up on all of the subtle clues left behind all this time. Now let's talk about WTF values. Just because Amori is a psychological horror game, doesn't mean it isn't allowed to have surprising scares. While randomized easter eggs generally aren't fun for completionists since they usually require an amount of grinding or mindless replaying in order to experience, randomized scares can sometimes be more interesting because it causes different players to have different experiences. 
which can fuel the paranoia and confusion felt by playing these psychological horror games. In Amori, the WTF value is a randomised number between 1 and 3, which is assigned to the player and locked in the first time they enter the vast forest and headspace. Having certain WTF values will cause certain strange events to occur, some of which are related to the psychological horror of the game. So let's go through these scary ones. If the WTF value is greater than or equal to 2, Amori will find a photo of someone familiar in the junkyard. If Amori interacts with it, the photo will turn into something for a few frames before disappearing. If the WTF value is greater than or equal to 3, in the Lost Forest, a floating Mari sprite from Black Space appears very briefly in the top right corner of the room. It disappears quickly after being seen. If the WTF value is greater than or equal to 6, and Sunny opens the door to Mari on the first night, immediately going to Sunny's mother's room will show Hell Mari hovering above the bed for exactly 666 frames before disappearing. Also, when Sunny goes to bed, and we see various camera shots around the room, we can see Helmari looming over Sunny in two of them. If the WTF value is greater than or equal to 6, there is an event in one of the houses Amori can find in the Hikikomori route when swimming with Mari. When exiting the house, Stranger will briefly appear in the room. In a similar vein, if the WTF value is greater than or equal to 8, Amori can find a stranger version of Basil's grandmother standing outside a rundown house in the middle of the ocean. And finally, if the WTF value is equal to 13 on the Hikikomori route, on the moving day, all of the movers will be replaced by shadow versions. So essentially, these WTF values can create a more unique experience for the player due to the RNG nature of the random events. Most people feel fear when being watched, especially from blind spots like from behind, where we feel most vulnerable. It's human instinct to feel nervous when you think that someone is watching you. Amori utilizes this specific fear to convey psychological horror by inducing a sense of paranoia in its player. Throughout Amori, the player will occasionally stumble across this strange creature, which appears in places it doesn't make sense to appear in. This creature is called something. The player will see something many many times in both headspace and the real world. Something has a very plain design, being a black ghost-like blob with a single eye. But the brilliance of this design is its simplicity, as it draws attention to its most standout feature, that large eye. Players will immediately notice the eye and remember it as something's defining characteristic, which makes its scare factor all the more effective. Because what does an eye do? It watches. And what do humans fundamentally dislike? Being unknowingly watched, especially from behind. Despite its creepy appearance, something is a very passive creature. Most of the time, when they are encountered in headspace, they will disappear as soon as Amori gets too close to them. Really, there are only two times something becomes actively aggressive in the game. When it chases Amori down a hallway at the end of the second headspace chapter, and when Sunny fights something in order to overcome his fears. On the other hand, the fact that something isn't much of a threat to the player makes it all the more creepier, because it's elusive. It doesn't want to fight. It doesn't want its presence to be known. It just wants to hide and watch. And this can be seen in something's appearances in the real world. During certain times in the game at night, if Sunny looks at a mirror, he may see something looming directly behind him, or even trying to blend into the darkness of the doorway. These scares further feed into the fears of being watched, yet there's nothing you can do about it. So every time you catch a glimpse of something hiding in a thorny rose bush, or out at sea through your binoculars, or through the keyhole between white space and headspace, you know that something is watching you. And of course it's made even creepier once you have the full context of the game, and you know that something is a manifestation of Sunny's trauma after seeing Mari's dishevelled hair covering her face, with only one eye visible. As I said with the game's foreshadowing, replaying the game after understanding the full story can make it even more unsettling once you start picking up on the hints that Mari was something all along. Something appears on a tree stump in Pyrefly Forest, referencing the fact that Mari's death was framed by hanging her on a tree which was subsequently chopped down by her father. If Amori ever returns to white space prematurely, Ghost Mari will be standing somewhere there. Walking near her will cause her to disappear and reappear somewhere else in white space. After making her disappear and reappear a few times, the next time, Mari will briefly turn into something before disappearing and not reappearing again. There is a grove in Vast Forest that has a lone tree with a tire swing. If Amori has conquered all three fears and lingers around the tree for a little, the screen starts darkening and eyes start appearing, as well as an overlay of Mari's corpse in the centre. 
before the screen glitches and turns back to normal, albeit with the tire swing missing. When you look through the keyhole at Amori's white space, something can be seen hovering over the main area. This is because white space is modelled after Mari's picnic blanket, so of course something would find its way there. When making the final stretch to the tree during the truth segment, you can see that the noose is casting a shadow that looks a lot like something. Once you realise the full context, you start to see that something is not only watching Amori and Sunny, but judging them. Because for every second Amori is strolling around headspace with his friends, or Sunny is beating up the neighbourhood scooter gang, another second passes that Mari's true fate goes unresolved. Basil also possesses his own something, which manifests as a sprawling black web which normally appears on the ground or around Basil's waist. A common theory as to why it looks like this is that, similar to how the image of Mari's hanging body is burned into Sunny's memory, the image of Mari's corpse lying at the bottom of the stairs may be ingrained in Basil's mind. We hardly ever see Basil something, but we can see that it has teeth, which symbolises how the guilt and trauma of framing Mari's death is literally eating Basil up. While not as creepy as Sunny something in my opinion, Basil something is still thoroughly unnerving. But since we're already talking about regular somethings, we should also discuss the phobias, since they are also referred to as something during their respective fights. Each of the three phobias represents one of Sunny's three biggest fears, acrophobia, arachnophobia, and thalassophobia. They each manifest as a physical object that Sunny needs to learn to defeat to overcome. Acrophobia is a mess of hands protruding from a flight of stairs. Arachnophobia is a massive spider hanging on a wall. And Thalassophobia is a clump of ominous seaweed in deep water. Each of the three phobias can be deeply disturbing due to their creepy designs, the droning background ambience, and the dark lighting creating an air of suspense and mystery. Furthermore, both the arachnophobia and thalassophobia may also spark genuine fear in a player stricken with those particular fears. The former because it's shaped like an actual spider, and the latter because the aquatic background and dark lighting invokes a real sense of being deep underwater. It also doesn't help that the acrophobia and arachnophobia enemies are made of eyes, which is of course the frequent motive this game relies on for inducing paranoia. But obviously, the part of Amori designed most primarily to scare the player is black space. But before we venture there, let's have a quick history lesson and talk about the main inspiration to black space, Yume Niki, so we can learn what fundamentally makes black space scary. Yume Niki is a 2004 game created by Kiki Yama, a Japanese developer. The game centers around a small hikikomori girl, Madotsuki, who ventures through her dreams to collect 24 effect items. Even though Yume Niki was made in RPG Maker 2003, it lacks a lot of elements of RPG games. There's no battle mechanics, or even a plot in general. The whole game is simply Madotsuki walking around in her dreams, collecting items. And we as players have no idea why we are doing this. There's a constant air of mystery surrounding the entire premise of the game, which isn't helped by the fact that there is barely any dialogue. Although NPCs do exist in the dream worlds, they hardly ever give dialogue and mostly exist to provide ambience, or to transport Madotsuki to other worlds. So even though they appear to be other characters in the game, the experience is still very lonely. Most of the game feels like Madotsuki is just wandering in a vast, unfamiliar land, which is very unsettling. Due to the lack of any storytelling elements, the plot of this game is basically left to the player's imagination, which can make the experience even more confusing and disorienting. This is not helped by the game's ending, which is very abrupt if you haven't yet figured out an interpretation of the story. Almost nothing about this game's progression makes any sense, which makes everything about it even creepier, since we as players have no idea what is happening or why we're doing the things we're doing. Of course, the primary fear factor comes from the aesthetics of the dream worlds. There are dozens of dream worlds to explore, yet only 12 are available from the beginning hub world. All other worlds can be accessed by interacting with NPCs or entering new rooms, making a lot of the different worlds interconnected with one another. Each dream world is unique in how they look, and each contributes their own sense of unnerving vibes. Some worlds have weird distorted background images, some have looping patterns, and some are pure black. Some worlds have a semblance of structure and sense, while many other worlds are very nonsensical and surreal, with random sprites thrown all over the place, and some are just empty voids with random objects scattered around. There's a barren world of snow, sparsely decorated with pine trees, but then there's a desert world with twisted weeds, statues, and a pyramid. There's a black void filled only by random streetlights dotted everywhere, 
but then there's an 8-bit world paying blatant homage to Earthbound. The contrast between the worlds is jarring, which can add to the unsettling nature of the whole experience. From start to finish, the game is made to be very uncomfortable to experience. This is helped by the fact that most of the OST consists of droning sounds and discordant notes, making the whole experience feel incredibly ominous. The tracks are unique to each specific world, so the unsettling music never gets stale. There are also the weird easter eggs, which new players are rarely ever going to find, as they mostly happen by complete random chance. As I said when talking about Amori's WTF values, RNG easter eggs generally aren't fun for a consistent gameplay experience, since they require a player to do the same thing over and over again to get a randomised event to trigger. In horror games though, they can be an interesting element since it makes the experience more unique to individual players. The most well-known easter egg is Uboa. He's a cute little face man who appears in a very rare event in one specific area of the game. There is an NPC named Poniko who resides in a small house. Every time you go into their house and turn off their light, there is a 1 in 64 chance that Poniko will turn into Uboa, causing the house to distort and a strange noise to play. Touching Uboa sends Midoski to a strange world with white water, white hills, and a weird black and red monster looming in the background. There are no actual jump scares in Yumaniki, but there doesn't have to be. The lack of gameplay, the mystery from a lack of plot, the confusing aesthetics, and the lack of organised music makes for a very creepy and unnerving experience, which while not explicitly scaring the player, will keep them constantly on the edge of their seat. Something this game also does to enhance the psychological horror is a depiction of mental health. Many other games with psychological horror elements have portrayed mental health to cause fear in the player, but Yume Niki is arguably the first of these games. I personally think that Yume Niki does a good job of hinting towards Madotsuki having a mental health issue, but keeping it vague enough that it doesn't become a fully fleshed out plot point. It is heavily implied that Madotsuki experienced some form of bad trauma. As a hikikomori, Madotsuki is a shut-in and refuses to leave her room, which hints that she may have agoraphobia or some sort of anxiety. Furthermore, people who have had traumatic experiences often have bad dreams. According to sleepfoundation.org, dreams often reflect what we see and feel while we're awake. So after a traumatic experience, it's common to have nightmares and anxiety dreams. The content of these disturbed dreams often incorporates similar feelings and sensations to those experienced during the trauma. And then there's also the ending of the game, which while confusing as to the reason why she does what she does, certainly makes a little bit of sense for her character who is suffering from severe trauma or anxieties. Close. Generally, a portrayal of mental illness can enhance psychological horror, because players may be able to relate to the character as the player may have or know someone who has a similar issue. So this can actually be somewhat confronting and unsettling, which is really interesting and an intriguing way to incorporate mind screw elements of psychological horror. So hey, let's talk about that. Mental health and mental illness has been portrayed in many video games before Amori, especially those with psychological horror elements. For example, Doki Doki Literature Club tackles topics of depression and self-harm, Spec Ops The Lion, while not explicitly a psychological horror game, discusses notions of PTSD and dissociative identity disorder, and Silent Hill 2 dips a little into both aforementioned games. In these cases, mental illness is used as a twist to shock the player, which is a somewhat common element of psychological horror as it can make the player feel uneasy once they put all of the puzzle pieces together and realise, hey, this should have been obvious from the beginning. Doki Doki Literature Club has a twist near the end of the first act where Sayori, the kind, energetic, and helpful girl, is actually suffering from severe depression, and only puts on a fake persona to make other people happy and ensure other people stop worrying about her issues. Spec Ops The Lion reveals at the very end that the player character, Captain Martin Walker, is unknowingly suffering from PTSD and has been hallucinating many driving plot points, such as hearing the voice of the villain through his transceiver, even though said transceiver doesn't have any batteries or seeing his dead friend's faces on enemy soldiers' bodies. And Silent Hill 2's major twist is the reveal that the main character, James Sunderland, is imagining the whole setting of the game, as he is in deep depression due to Mercy killing his sick wife, and is trying to mentally punish himself for being an accomplice in her suicide. Amori pulls something of a twist like this. It is hinted at, very early on, that Sunny has some sort of mental illness. The white space diary is filled with disturbing drawings, and the way for Sunny to wake up is to have Amori stab himself in the chest. Furthermore, Sunny suffers from extreme hallucinations and nightmares, 
notably the physical manifestations of his fears, and has been shown to block traumatic objects out of his mind to the point where we, as the player, are unable to see them, such as the closet next to the staircase, which even we can't see except during scares and plot points. Also, black space exists, which showcases Sunny's disturbing hidden thoughts, and they are not pretty, but we'll talk about that later. Essentially, it can be diagnosed that Sonny has a sort of dissociative amnesia. He has experienced a highly traumatic event, which has caused him to repress any memories which may remind him of said traumatic event. Whenever something seems amiss in Headspace, it just glitches out and disappears. Every time Headspace Basil tries to discuss something important with Amori, he's promptly disposed of. So in truth, the real crux of the game's twist is not what mental illness Sonny has, but rather how he came to develop it. And we learn that from the truth sequence, where Sonny uncovers what caused his trauma to begin with. I've already made a video analysing this entire chapter of the game, but in summary, Sonny is recollecting disorganised fragments of his memory from the day his trauma developed, and as he picks up mental images of the frightful event, he starts to see himself as more and more of a monster, until finally, he realises that he was the one to kill Mari, accidentally pushing her down the stairs. Sonny, shocked and in denial of what he had done, dragged Mari back up the stairs and into bed, hoping she was only unconscious. Basil, who happened to be in the house at the time, devised a plan. With help from the catatonic Sonny, Basil carried Mari to the backyard and hanged her on the tree using a jump rope noose. While the realism of this traumatic event is questionable, the fact is that this game does a very good job portraying Sonny's mental illness. This is exemplified by the final boss fight against Amori himself, who is a physical manifestation of Sonny's trauma and constantly insults and degrades Sonny, trying to break his spirit and force him to return to the endless cycle of repression. Portraying mental health in a video game, done realistically, can be a great source of psychological horror simply because it feels real. Most of the time, we play video games as a form of escapism, so we can entertain ourselves and have fun outside of our dreary lives. But then, when games hit us with these serious topics, like mental health, you get brought suddenly back to reality. And that feeling often manifests as being uncomfortable or distressed, which is really fascinating. Of course, that is if and only if the game portrays mental health right. Messages about mental health are an iffy topic in media, because creators have to walk a fine line between not making it obvious enough that the player won't pick up on the message, and making the message too overblown that it comes off as ham-fisted or offensive. In my opinion, however, Amori very successfully portrays Sunny's dissociative amnesia, and respectfully uses it to develop the psychological horror of the game. But I think there are more similarities between Yume Niki and Amori than just a strong depiction of mental illness. I wonder what that could be. Black Space is, very obviously, a loving homage to Yume Niki. Well, to an extent, the entirety of Amori is, because there are a lot of similarities. Both Sunny and Madotsky barely speak, and both are hikikomoris. In both stories, at least half of the gameplay involves journeying through the protagonist's dreams. Sunny, Amori, and Madotsky have weird obsessions with using knives as weapons. If a certain ending is achieved in Amori, Sunny will jump off a building to his death, similar to the ending of Yume Niki. But the most obvious similarity is the existence of Black Space, which is essentially a whole Yume Niki fan game within another game. At the very beginning of the second Headspace chapter, Amori gains access to a game of Hangman on his laptop. The goal is to collect a variety of keyboard keys scattered across Headspace, which are used to spell out a certain phrase. This phrase, which can only be spelled out once all Headspace story content is completed, is Welcome to Black Space. After venturing back to Basil's house and jumping into the gaping hole in the floor, Amori arrives at Black Space. In Black Space, his goal is to go through doors scattered across a black hub world to collect 18 black keys from 18 different worlds. Does this sound familiar? Yes, this is very similar to Yume Niki in that there is a hub world filled with random doors which lead the character to new worlds that contain collectible items, all without telling the player why they're doing anything. True to Yume Niki form, Amori's black space aesthetic are often surreal, bizarre, off-putting, and sometimes downright creepy. Regardless of which door in black space you enter, you will always experience each world in the exact same order. All of the worlds are unsettling in their own ways, but let's go through some of the more notable ones. The first world is dark, ominous, and unnerving. The background is a shifting, distorted pattern. All of the sprites are weird amalgamations, like flowers with cat heads, rotting whale corpses, 
black spiders with mismatching limbs, long-beaked birds that emit low groaning when interacted with, and larger versions of Amori with black ooze running down his face, among many other disturbing things. The ambience is just pulsing droning. This world is a very good introduction to the unsettling and emotionally draining chapter ahead. The second world is much more lighthearted, but still very creepy. The background is shifting random neon colours, and the background ambience is off-tune wind music. All of the sprites are much more nonsensical and silly. There are multicoloured puddles on the ground and cute little self-portraits of Amori, but there are also distorted cat snakes and weird monochromatic cacti which look like they should belong in the previous world. There's also a cloud that asks you to follow him, but he doesn't lead you anywhere important. He's funny. But even though this world is much more upbeat, the contrast between the first and second room makes it all the creepier. Skipping the third world, the fourth world is designed like a suburban neighbourhood, with houses lined up alongside connected roads. Everything is black or grey, all of the houses are identical, there are random objects in the middle of the road, like bathtubs, bent over scribbled stickmen, and skeleton deers stuck in looping running animations, and random grey smears all over the place. Only one of the houses can be entered for a small easter egg. Amori finds himself in a long hallway, with strange figures hanging from the ceiling by their hair. There's a painting which depicts a figure with their whole body concealed by hair draped over them. After interacting with the painting, the figure is suddenly out and slowly following Amori around, but disappears as soon as Amori leaves the room. The fifth world is a barren plain decorated with a few dead trees scattered about. There are a couple of NPCs standing around who vaguely resemble women, and they all make hoarse grunting sounds when interacted with. While Amori walks through the world, dialogue boxes randomly pop up saying, Liar. There are also little black goo balls with eyes on them that squish and groan when stepped on. In order to obtain the key, Amori must interact with something, which is just floating above a tree stump. Something then follows Amori around, saying, I love you, until Amori collects the key and exits back to the hub. It's a clever callback to all those times we've seen something looming over Sunny's shoulder in the mirror. Now we get to see something loom over Amori's shoulder in the overworld. The sixth world is arguably the most infamous of them all. Amori enters a small enclosed room, with Muo strapped down to a table with surgical equipment placed on the side. The cat butler in the room tells you that Muo has been very, very bad before giving Amori the key. You would think this is a great thing, because now you can just leave the room and continue your adventure. Well, the game doesn't let Amori leave the room from where he came, and since the room is so small, the only other thing to interact with is Muo, and the game doesn't hold back. It straight up asks you, do you want to cut open Muo, yes or no? And if you say yes, it asks again and again, and each time, Muo gets more and more panicked, until finally... And the horrible truth is, you never had to kill Muo. If you check your menu, you will find that your stab option is available, and that Amori could have simply stabbed himself to go back to the hub. This scene is absolutely terrifying because it shows how the game can trick you into doing something horrible. You're trapped and you think the only way out is to murder your pet cat, and it feels deeply uncomfortable because you have to confirm your choice multiple times before it actually happens. And then you feel so guilty and unsettled by your own actions once you realise there was a way out that never involved killing Mio. That's good psychological horror. Forcing the player to undergo an uncomfortable experience and leave them unnerved, unsettled, and emotionally drained by the end. The 11th world is one of the most disturbing ones. The background is a shifting purple mess and looking closely or separating the background files reveals a hidden message which reads, Kill me. All of the NPCs are versions of Amori's friends erratically walking around. Interacting with them yields a blank dialogue box, as well as a glimpse of their faceless portraits. The only two that are slightly different are Basil and Mari. The second time you interact with a Basil NPC, his portrait will be blotted out by his something. The second time you interact with Mari, her portrait will be something. And the third time, it will be Hell Mari. And that isn't even touching on every world where Basil is killed. There are five of these instances where Basil joins the party and promptly dies, and they all range from terrifyingly disturbing to creepily bizarre and surreal. The first time is in the seventh world, where Omori is breaking watermelons to find a key. However, when breaking the seventh watermelon, Basil breaks apart instead. This can be shocking on a first playthrough, since Basil's death comes out of nowhere, but is admittedly quite funny on replay. In the ninth world, Amori immediately encounters Basil, who he frees from a spiderweb. As they walk along, Basil starts getting more and more covered in small black spiders. Being a kind boy, Basil is fine with them at first, and thinks of them as friends. But then they start biting him, all while the screen gets progressively darker and darker, with spider legs appearing on the border. 
Eventually, Basil is completely covered and begs Amori for help. The Twelfth World has Amori find Basil at the top of a scaffolding structure. As they make their way down, they encounter an elevator. The elevator takes them nowhere, but when Basil steps out, we are treated to a grotesque scene where Basil is crushed by the elevator doors. Considerably the weakest Basil death is in the 14th world, where he and Amori ride down a river on a raft. For a brief period of time, while they are in a tunnel and unseen by the player, Basil is quickly decapitated, exiting the tunnel with no head. Presumably it was Amori who directly killed him in this instance. The 18th world has Amori and Basil venture through a path that looks like the neighbor's room, and encounter Hiro who silently leads them forward. The path progressively gets more and more glitched and distorted, as does the music. Eventually, Amori and Basil find Aubrey and Kel, both of whom attack Basil with baseballs and a bat, brutally killing him. The repeated killing off of a character for unjustifiable reasons is suitably a good example of nightmare fuel in psychological horror games, which can be done to scare the player by inflicting suffering on NPCs. Oh, and don't get me started on Black Space 2. Black Space 2 is only available on the Hikikomori route after completing specific requirements. Black Space 2 can be accessed by entering white space and interacting with the laptop, at which point Amori is transported back to the Black Space hub world, but all of the worlds are different. This chapter of the game leans even more heavily on the Yume Niki inspiration. Black Space 2 is essentially the original Black Space amped up to 11, with significantly more surreal worlds and much, much more nightmare fuel. While the original Black Space had Amori access each of the different worlds from the hub, Black Space 2 follows the footsteps of Yume Niki by having Amori instead go through five worlds that branch out to other locations, which makes navigation intentionally more confusing. These starting worlds are a black forest, a dock, a second black forest, a weather vane area, and a cloud walkway. As said, each world branches into more worlds. To be completely fair, they aren't really more worlds per se, but small locales designed to unsettle the player. For example, in Black Forest 1, Amori can enter this animal carcass to be transported to a black void with distorted humanoid creatures, or Amori can instead go through a door that leads to a creepy version of the Headspace Playground, where none of the usual NPCs are present and large Amori heads have been placed everywhere. You can go into one of the heads to enter a dark version of Sunny's room where he is sleeping in bed while Helmari looms over him. Another Amori head leads to an endless hallway where your three party members keep walking backwards away from Amori as he approaches them. In Black Space 2, there really is no goal or end objective. The whole purpose is to explore this disturbing realm of Sunny's imagination and of course, get creeped out. In any case, Black Space 2 is a massive topic that's difficult to explore in a video of this structure other than me just saying, yeah, Black Space 2 is kinda spooky because it's like Yume Niki. If you want a more in-depth analysis of what Black Space 2 is all about, I recommend you go watch Sleepy Crest's super long video breaking down each segment of Black Space 2 and what they mean to the lore of the overall game. Link in the description. All in all, both Black Space 1 and 2 are thoroughly creepy and unnerving chapters in Amori and very obviously draw direct inspiration from Yume Niki. The black spaces are very successful at emulating the same vibes as Yume Niki, but are still stylistically distinct in some ways. Obviously, Amori has a story, which is its most appealing trait, while Yume Niki's main point of attraction is a lack of coherent plot. There's also the fact that Yume Niki favours the more confusing and surreal elements through frequent style changes to confuse the player, and bizarre interconnectivity of the worlds to cause disorientation. On the other hand, Black Space's aesthetics remain mostly monochromatic save for a few rare instances, and lean more towards visual horror and nightmare fuel than Yume Niki does. Despite their differences however, Yume Niki and Amori's Black Spaces both stand out as prime examples of surrealistic psychological horror. So, what have we learnt from this video? Amori utilises plenty of psychological horror elements to scare the player, or at least creep them out a little. Foreshadowing and forward hints is a good element to implement to confuse newbies while also rewarding veteran players by giving them a little bit more anxiety knowing that the truth was staring them in the face the whole time. RNG events, 
such as the WTF values, while unreliable, can make each individual player have a more distinct or unique experience, which adds to the confusion and paranoia when different people end up gaslighting each other by complete accident. Drawing upon instinctive human fears, like fear of heights, spiders, large bodies of water, and being unwittingly watched, can also be a source of psychological horror, which is pulled off very well by the ultimately harmless but foreboding family of somethings which consistently torment the player character. It is good to portray mental illness, as it can raise awareness, as well as be used as a good horror element for making the player disturbed by a frighteningly realistic depiction of a serious topic in a video game. And finally, drawing upon other successful source material isn't necessarily a bad thing, as long as you can portray a similar style, theme, or overall vibe in a somewhat original way. Both of Amori's black spaces are obvious references to Yume Niki. So yeah, Amori is a pretty spoopy game. Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like and subscribe and all that arbitrary stuff. I also have a Discord server, which I've linked in the description. If this video does well, I might consider turning this into a series and analyse some other psychological horror games, because that's totally not going to harm my sleep schedule. Anyway, see you on the next video.